Dear friends, dear colleagues, it was a profound shock and the deepest grief we received the sad news on 22 February that our esteemed colleague and dear friend, Professor Benno Ndulu, Mualim Nyerere, Professorial Chair in Development at the University of Dar es Salaam and Chair of the Board of Uni Wider, had passed at the age of 71. Benno embodied all of the human professional qualities which intellectual and policy leaders should aspire to achieve. Inspiring, sacrificing, extremely effective and influential, and yet modest and forthcoming. Always with a warm and broad smile that immediately made everyone comfortable, be the head of state, a colleague, or a student seeking his wise counsel. This wider development conference special session would commemorate and celebrate the life of work of Benno, this unusual person who always had so much to offer wherever he found himself. And throughout deeply concerned about the young, the next generation who will shape the future of Africa and the world. This panel will recall his many contributions as an international leader in academic research for African and global development. His key role in bringing top quality policy research and practice together, and his outstanding performance as an institution builder and executive director of the ARC. And finally, the panel will pay homage to him as a treasured mentor, deliberating on his legacy in the Tanzania Economics Society. Our panel include, in the order in which they will speak, Stephen O'Connell, Steve is Professor of Economics at Swarthmore College and was Chief Economist of USAID in 2014-15. He's published widely on macroeconomic policy and growth in Sub-Saharan Africa and was co-editor with Benno of the ARC's two-volume study, The Political Economy of Economic Growth in Africa, 1960-2000. Enyoguna Ndungu. Enyoguna is the Executive Director of the ARC following in the footsteps of Benno. Enyoguna is also the immediate governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, with numerous collaborative relations with his close colleague, Inda Benundulu, who completed 10 years of service as Central Bank governor of the Bank of Tanzania. Ernest Ayiti. Ernest is Secretary General of the African Research Universities Alliance of Rua, a network of 16 of Africa's flagship universities, and he's former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana. He's chair of the board of the ARC and was previously chair of the board of Union Wider, a position Benno assumed in 2019. And to conclude, Landina Kilema. Landina is outstanding among the numerous researchers Benno mentored, and she now works as an economic advisor to the president of the United Republic of Tanzania. She was the CEO of the Economic Society of Tanzania, of which Benno was the president until his passing. After these four presentations, I will make a few closing remarks, and I'll invite you to observe a minute of silence before moving to a separate room where participants will have the opportunity to recall and share with the rest of us memorable moments with Benno. Thank you. And Steve, you now have the floor. I'm Steve O'Connell. It's a privilege to share some thoughts about Benno as a scholar who served as a bridge between the worlds of research and policy and devoted his life to building that bridge throughout the continent. Benno was in secondary school at the time of the Arusha Declaration on Socialism and Self-Reliance in Tanzania in 1967. He entered the University of Dar es Salaam in 1971. In rural Tanzania, President Nyerere's program to resettle smallholders into Ujamaa villages for collective farming was entering an intense phase. 
Benno published his first research paper in 1973 as an undergraduate. Nearly 30 years later, Professor Issa Shivji, with the grudging admiration of a fiery Marxist, cites this paper as a highlight of the exhilarating campus debates of the time and an exemplar of the Maoist concept of no evidence, no right to speak. Benno's paper was based on primary research among farmers in the Rufiji River Basin south of Dar es Salaam. In 1968, severe flooding had displaced smallholders from the basin and President Nureri had taken the opportunity to resettle them into Ujamaa villages on higher ground. But by the early 1970s, farmers were moving back. Why? Benno and his co-authors showed that the typical farmer's labor was more productive under the vulnerable conditions of the floodplain than on the lower quality land operated collectively by the Ujamaa villages. In what ultimately proved a pervasive policy failure, the pressure of subsistence was driving smallholders back. Benno's 1979 PhD dissertation at Northwestern is entitled the Role of Transportation in Agricultural Production, the Case of Tanzania. He begins the dissertation with quotations from the British Chief Railway Engineer in Tanganyika in 1945 and from Tanzania's first post-Arusha five-year plan in 1969. Only then do we hear Benno's voice, and I quote, I found it proper to start with these two strong policy quotations under two very different regimes to show the continuous emphasis transportation policy has received in economic development in general and agricultural development in particular in Tanzania." Unquote. There's a subtle gambit here that defined Benno as a researcher. He would depoliticize debate by asserting common ground, economic development in Tanzania, in order to focus participants from all quarters on the question of how to get there. The best evidence would carry the day. That was the bridge he was building. The dissertation is a model of clarity and creativity. He uses the German army's destruction of railways during World War I as what we now call a natural experiment to show that changes in transport costs affect the commercialization of agriculture and the allocation of farm labor between cash and food crops. The supply response to farm gate prices is crucial in his theory, and he finds large and significant responses using regional data on cotton and rice. He then addresses the government's policy of paying the same crop prices to farmers in all parts of the country. To President Nyerere, pan-territorial pricing was a fundamental expression of solidarity and egalitarianism. To Benno, it was one potential way, among others, of getting to the goals of the Arusha Declaration. Benno makes it clear that by paying uniform prices, the government was subsidizing long and difficult transport routes over short and easy ones. He estimates the large efficiency distortion and also the fiscal burden. Equity goals might justify these costs, but the country's most prosperous subsistence farmers were far from Dar es Salaam. As an instrument for equity, therefore, the policy was backwards. It was imposing an implicit tax on the poorest farmers who lived closest to Dar es Salaam. Here's the final sentence of that dissertation. Quote, I sincerely feel that interregional transport subsidy policy should be examined with closer scrutiny so that the nation knows what costs are incurred in implementing it and whether it is effective in achieving the social objective of egalitarianism." Unquote. Benno never lost that commitment to scrutiny or that unique combination of courage and modesty. Of Benno's nine books and nearly 50 articles, I'll briefly focus on two characteristic pieces. In his 1986 article, Governance and Economic Management, Benno starts with the insight that in many countries, the proliferation of black markets in response to government controls had undermined the effectiveness of those controls and, quote, significantly altered the political calculus of economic adjustment, unquote. There was therefore a political window of opportunity for economic reforms. 
But as always, Benno was playing the long game. It was unclear, he said, whether African governments would sustain the needed reforms once crisis conditions had improved. Sustainable reform, he wrote, will hinge upon the strengthening of institutional structures capable of defending the resultant changes, unquote. So in this 1986 paper, Benno anticipates a literature on institutions and growth that would not even take off until the 1990s when big cross-country data sets became available. His emphasis was on the role of institutions in creating a favorable environment for private investment. He writes with deeply informed specificity about public sector management and urgent pragmatism on the need to reduce dependency on donor-driven agendas and advisors. His discussion of the importance of university research in Africa is a clear precursor of his role in establishing the AERC. There is a nuanced understanding of the political economy of reform and a signal to donors that front-loaded aid flows could help governments navigate the short-run politics of reform by maintaining vital imports, infrastructure services, and social services. Two decades later, Benno had built the AERC, contributed to the seniorage and debt literatures, served as research manager at the World Bank, and written his most cited paper with me entitled Governance and Growth in Sub-Saharan Africa. He was at the World Bank, and we were wrapping up the AERC project on the political economy of economic growth in Africa. That, po that project focused on the drivers and consequences of intervention, crisis, and market-based reform. In, in his 2007 book, Challenges of African Development, Benno asks a different question. What does the African developmental state look like? Benno had always insisted on an activist developmental role for governments, even when acknowledging the need to scale back and target more effectively. Now, with reforms largely consolidated, he draws on the global gro growth evidence to, to identify the four eyes of African development. In investment, innovation, infrastructure, and institutions. In each domain, he strikes a balance between the roles of the state, the market, and non-state and external institutions, recognizing the unique capabilities and limitations of each, and proposing a concrete vision consistent with inclusive development. In retrospect, these four pillars run like a thread through Benno's scholarly writings. A balanced strategy is now central to how African governments and regional institutions conceive of development strategy, a reality that was of immense significance to Benno and for which he gave credit always to others. Benno was still playing the long game when he died. And in fact, our paper, African De Africa's Development Debts, is forthcoming in the Journal of African Economies. As a research collaborator, Benno was all in. He was astoundingly fast and responsive, and always, subtly or not, a coach as well as a collaborator. One of my favorite emails is entitled, Steve, I don't think it's time to panic. Our central argument in that paper is that the preservation of development assets should be at the center of efforts to manage the debts accumulated during the 2000s. Benno's voice comes through clearly. I'm grateful to Finn and to UNU Wider for this opportunity to remember Benno with you. We've lost a towering presence in our lives and for Africa. Benno built a bridge between research and policy in Africa. Keeping that bridge open and vital is an invitation to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve, for calling attention to Ben's many contributions as an intellectual academic leader uh, in our field. This is much appreciated. We will now move on uh, to the presentation by uh, Enyuguna, uh, the executive director of the ARC. Enyuguna, you have the floor. Let me, thank, let me start by thanking you and you, Waira, for organizing this session. 
and also for the chairman, FinTAP, for coordinating this effort in an effort to honor our foreign hero, Professor Ben Andrew. We at the ARC are very grateful for this. I have a few, I have a few slides that I'm going to share. And uh, let me start uh, by sharing them so that at least you can see the content of, under which we hold our hero, Ben Oduru. First, let me say that we are celebrating Professor Ben Oduru, who is an intellectual and a policy leader. And we're very happy at the ARC for doing this. And I'm going to bring a few tributes uh, or a few issues, a few areas where Ben has contributed, not only in terms of intellectual input, but also as a policy advisor and a policy leader. First, first, let me start by where we are at the ARC. A ARC is a capacity building network that comprises of capacity building through research and even graduate training. And we also have a policy outreach and uh, communication. And this helps us in terms of trying to help capacity that will go into institutions mid-level career of government and even policy leaders in the network in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is the structure that Benno helped create way back in 1988. And this is the approach we use to date for capacity building and knowledge generation in sub-Saharan Africa. Second, let me talk about Ben Onduru, the thought leader. He, has, he was the leading right at the University of Dar es Salaam and his publications span four decades. Some of the trails of revolutionary contributions involve, for example, Agenda for Africa Economic Rene Renewal in the 1990s that set the stage for richer and comprehensive reforms in African economies. Second, growth and adjustment in sub-Saharan Africa, and this is also the time when ARC was uh, established just to deal with the issues of structural adjustment. And here, Beno actually outlined economic reforms in sub-Saharan Africa that is required, and this is by 1991. The third area which is very important for us is economic directions, uh, new directions in, in development economics, which was published in 1996. And that gave even us young economists the direction that we need to take when we're looking at development economics. Fourth, governance and growth in sub-Saharan Africa. And these are issues that we have that has preoccupied our researchers for many years. And finally, and not the least, there are so many of them, we wanted to parade them, is the political economy of economic growth in Africa. And this was published in 2000. And this was really a, a leading light in terms of what uh, African economic growth is all about and the difference between different countries in Africa, the coastal, uh, coastal rich countries, coastal resource rich countries, uh, red rock resource uh, uh, poor countries and all that. And this has helped shift the policy narrative in Africa because it's, just, it's actually not one narrative, but diverse narrative depending on country characteristics. And for us, this is a lesson that we have learned for many years. The second thing is I wanted to show that Ben Onduru was a reading, uh, is, a, is a reader in terms of innovation and capacity building. And the first direct, direct he was the first director of the ARC, uh, director of ARC research. And he is the one who actually developed the building blocks of capacity building. Second, he was also the first African executive director of the AERC in 1992. For us, we are happy to report and even to showcase that he has provided pioneering development at the ARC. And the collaborative research in the 1990s and the graduate training in 1993 is a good example. So he has, this has supported the ARC network and the secretariat with innovative ideas for capacity building and funding ARC activities since then. From where he was sitting as governor of the Bank of Tanzania, he was coordinating the ARC African Central Bank governors, the program committee, and even he has made some contribution, tangible contribution at the ARC board, even when he had left the ARC. But, the leading policy advisor in Beno is quite uh, remarkable. The first ARC senior policy seminar in 1995 was supposed to reach out to policymakers and share research findings and a link to practical policy implementation. And since then, every month of the year, we have held senior policy seminar in diverse topics. He had a long stint at the World Bank in Tanzania as a lead economist 
and, and, and in the Vice President and Chief Economist Office in, the, in, the, in Washington, D.C. of the World Bank. He was also economic advisor to the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. He has had an advisory role from, from, uh, from governments to government agencies as well as multilateral institutions. He was the economic advisor to the, to the President of the Republic of South Africa, but the, advisor, the, but the history of his advisory role in, in, uh, in the Republic of South Africa starts way back in the 1990s. And the most successful and celebrated, he's one of the most successful and celebrated governor of the central bank in this region and beyond. He served as the governor of Bank of Tanzania from 2008 to 2018, a 10 years period which has seen a remarkable uh, development in central banking and even monetary policy. Being the policy leader is actually quite fascinating. Designing monetary policy in the Bank of Tanzania, that was very, very critical. He was a leading light in monetary policy reforms, uh, regional integration in the East African community and even the Sandak region. He was a leading light in payments system, that is the East African payment system, and the pioneering push for digital financial systems, starting with retail electronic payment system in East Africa. Tanzania uh, uh, also published the book on the path to prosperity, and he was one of the editors and even a contributor. And that for us is really a leading light in terms of path to prosperity. And finally, he, he, he was a commissioner by the time of his demise with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Digital Pathways for Prosperity Commission on, on te Technology and Inclusive Development, development in Brabant Nick School of Government in Oxford. But let me also come to a personal level. He was a friend to me and a mentor. He was a friend to me and a role model and also a mentor. He was the only governor in, in, the African, in the African region to accept and replicate Kenyans and PESA in the Bank of Tanzania. And M-PESA is an electronic payments platform, a literal, a literal electronic payment platform that was started in Kenya in 2007 and has been replicated uh, across, uh, across the East African region and now it's reaching out to outside Africa. He was at my defense when the IMF and the World Bank doubted Kenyans and PESA the retail electronic payments platform and financial inclusion goal. The two countries are now the most successful, that is Kenya and Tanzania, are the most successful in digital financial services, financial inclusion and electronic payments infrastructure. We then combined forces to lead the way in into formulating monetary policy framework in East African countries with the support of I IGC. He supported me as chair in the formation of Alliance for Financial Inclusion, AFI, in 2009, a network of financial regulators that coordinated financial and still coordinates financial inclusion in our policies in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. He later became chair of AFI and pushed its expansion. And that is how it has stood even to date. It's one of the most prolific network on policy formulation. We have received tributes but from so many, and this was in our previous uh, biannual in um, in, in, in June this year. And we asked several uh, reading rights and uh, even those who are there in the formation of ARC and later to, to provide tributes. We have so many and it is actually in our website. But I just wanted to just show you a few and I don't want to read the, the tributes. Uh, the, these slides will be available, but I want to recognize Professor Anna Bixen, the Professor Jerry Herina, uh, Dr. Barbara Burungi, Dr. Joyce Mook, Professor Shanta Devarajan, Professor E.B. Ajay, Professor Stephen O'Connor, Dr. Rohinton Merora, and finally, one of our uh, perhaps uh, prolific uh, policymakers in Africa, Dr. Kefara Yansane. The way forward is that we have to keep the memories of our hero alive. And we at the ARC are asking ourselves, how do we do this? The first thing is that we're going to start with the memorial lectures during the December, bi December biannual, starting with the, the December 2021 biannual conference. We'll be having Beno's memorial lectures. The second thing is that we're going to organize and we're still continuing to organize and uh, arrange and develop a, a, a publication of a volume in Beno's memory. And we are working towards that, especially uh, Stephen O'Connor and Shanta Devarajan and ourselves in the ARC, we are working very hard on that. And finally, we are going to establish scholarships in the name of Professor Ben Onduru. 
And this will be awarded to the best male and female candidates every year at the, AR, in, at the ARC graduate training programs. And we do believe that these three areas and maybe others that we may think about in future will be very, very important in keeping the memories of our hero alive. And finally, we might be saying painfully, rest in peace, our dear friend. But from all of us at the ARC, let me say in the East African way, Asante Sana. But of course, we also cover a uh, front from region, let me say, Mesibuku. And from all of us at the ARC, thank you very much. And uh, let my friend, our friend rest in internal peace. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Inyaguna, for so aptly uh, bringing out Beno's role in the interface between uh, research and policy making, and also so eloquently referring to his personal qualities, which we will, of course, always keep in our hearts. Now we move on to Ernest. Ernest, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin my remarks by thanking you and you wider for inviting me to join this special session in honor of our dear friend and colleague, Benu Ndulu. I first met Professor Benu Ndulu in November, 1988. This was at the first AERC biannual research workshop, which brought together more than 40 young researchers from several different African countries to Nairobi. It was at this meeting that we first learned of Benu's strong engagement with the network. He was there as director of research, but it was obvious that the entire operation did hinge on his uh, ability to organize things and bring people together. It was clear that his presence as director of research was not simply in order to tick a box for a year, but largely based on his shown competence. In March of 1994, Jeff Fine, who was executive director, left AERC and Ben replaced him. It was obvious that a very wise decision had been made by the board in appointing Benno to replace Jeff. It didn't take long before Benno began the process of expanding AERC. He encouraged him from different countries to join the network. He encouraged researchers from several different places and institutions to submit proposals to the network for consideration. His interest was not simply in growing the number of researchers, but also in broadening the scope of work done by the network. He was quite anxious to make the work of AERC relevant to the needs of the African nations. The network was after all meant to serve those nations and their need for evidence to support policy making. So, Benno began the process of transformation very early. And in doing this, brought in researchers and resource persons from different backgrounds and different nations who had a lot of promise in terms of what they could do for African economic research. Benno was very interested in diversification. Diversification not only of the themes, but also the source of funding for the network. He showed a lot of interest in moving beyond the original funders of AERC, finding new funders from other parts of Europe, and also looking beyond Europe to other places in North America and also Asia. 
that's how the funding base of AERC was expanded considerably in the 1990s. But beyond that, Menlo was very, very interested in getting African governments and African institutions to be active in organizing AERC. He sought assistance from the African Development Bank, he found it. He sought encouragement, in collaboration with the UN Economic Commission for Africa and also with the African Union. Several African governments were approached and some provided support in different ways. I'm very happy that uh, Menos initiatives paid off in several ways, not only in the resources coming to AERC, but also in the very rich resources base in the people. Menno believed in diversity. He wanted to see more women participate in the work of AERC. He toured the length and breadth of Africa, looking for women in various economic departments, finance ministries and treasuries, central banks, to support the work of AERC, to engage with AERC. To some extent, we saw success there. Bender wanted more Francophone participation. This also saw Francophone researchers coming from very unlikely places. In the end, AERC became a much more diversified unit, very strong, very capable. Beno believes strongly that the work done by AERC researchers should reflect the needs and the requirements of their countries. The senior policy seminar was introduced as a way of encouraging governments to be interested in the work being done by their nationals. So the senior policy seminar was a means to bring research to the doorstep of governments. It was also a means of helping governments to know who their active researchers were. Beyond the senior policy seminar, there were also national policy seminars supported by AERC, all very much the ideas coming from Beno. It was obvious that Beno had transformed AERC by the time he was leaving. It was obvious that Beno's contribution to the growth and transformation of AERC could not be taken lightly. What impressed many of us was Beno's private or personal lifestyle and how he used that to encourage people. Beno was a very friendly person. He engaged with each of us as friends, even though we had been brought together to work, we became friends. Because yes, with me, of almost everybody, Beno was a friend. Through this, he mentored young people. Through this, he counseled very young people. Everybody came to like and appreciate what he stood for. Everybody respected his integrity and everybody respected his intellect. Beno was a very strong pillar for African economic research. Today, we gathered here to mourn him and show our respect for him. Beno did everything possible to help improve the quality of economic research in Africa. It's my hope that in death, he will continue to influence us, that his legacy will be one that will guide young researchers in Africa, that his integrity, his reputation will strengthen many young researchers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ernest, for these warm words, recalling the importance of Beno as an institution builder and executive director of the ARC. I appreciate your contribution very, very much. And now we will pass the floor to Blandina. Blandina, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Finn. 
uh, it was really nice to hear from uh, Steve and John. Um, as uh, you would see, all of them have been introduced as professors and most of the friends um, that I got to meet through Beno were professors, but when you were with him, you were never intimidated by a lot of the good things that you had today. And so today, um, when Finn, uh, you reached out to me a couple of months ago, um, there are four things I want to talk about uh, Professor Benondul. Um, he was the father, that's something that I always say, but whenever he would introduce me to his students, then suddenly he was like, like my grandfather when it comes to the research world. The second bit, I worked with Benno after he left uh, the Bank of Tanzania, after he was the governor. So I knew him more as the president of the Economic Society of Tanzania. That's the second bit that I'd like to talk about. And then the third bit, and I think uh, all the other presenters also touched on it, is his drive for uh, learning, and particularly towards the end, a lot around technology, that will be the third thing. And the fourth thing that I'd like to touch on is um, his, um, uh, his really a drive to make sure that he's building um, capacity of young researchers from all diversified groups. I think those are the things that I would like uh, uh, to talk about. So the first bit, when I call him a grandfather, uh, but let's say a father at the same time, the one thing that strikes you so much is the way he would introduce you to anybody at any time when you ask for something. Um, and with that, then I found myself a lot of times when you're with Professor Ben Ondulu, in as much as he was a giant, you will feel like, you know what, I am okay. I belong here. Let me pull, pull up my socks and, you know, fit into this world. In such a way, when you read his work, you would feel it too, that he had the Lee uh, figure. And I think um, I agree with all the others. He was just not uh, famous and carrying it with him. But I think the biggest part with him was he was giving away his power to everybody who was around him. And with that, I think that's why he became so powerful. And I think that's the biggest lesson for all of us um, who have learned from, from him. And I would say like what uh, Ernest and Juguna has said, when we're thinking about the legacies that he is leaving behind, and particularly for us, um, is how you can really be humble, but really touch it as many people as you can. That's the first part. The second part is um, him as the president of the Economic Society of Tanzania. Um, I've learned so many things from him. So uh, today we, we hear a lot about his academic credentials. We hear a lot about his policy making skills. But for me, he was he connects not only the academics and the research bits, but how he was also really strong when it comes to administering um, and moving uh, different issues that we had. So at the Economic Society, in as much as we were organizing uh, the seminars and platforms for different um, 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 audiences, he will always say, Blandina, let's finish this meeting before it starts. He will always, always have time. No matter what, he will just have time. It's like, okay, if this meeting, let's say like today is on, um, on the 6th, let's meet on the 4th and make sure we've ticked everything that is required. And if there are things that need to be revised, he will advise accordingly. And I think um, that is a very rare thing. He was selfless uh, to his time, given like what you've heard others say, and we keep on hearing how um, um, established he was, but still he gave his time. And I think that is a lesson we can all um, uh, pick. Um, and when it comes again to the same bits around um, him being the president, he had this network um, um, that it was just on his fingertips. I remember Finn yourself, um, we asked you to help us organize one of our conferences and already he knew if you're talking about industrialization, you had these people in Vietnam, we can link with Finn, we can link with all these other speakers, we can link with Sam and everybody. He was just that quick to get um, people together to discuss an issue that he believes um, people need to understand uh, better and one joke that I always used to laugh uh, when he would say it, he would say, it's important that people run away from the brown knots. Perhaps this is more typical in Tanzania than 
and elsewhere in the world, but he was like, people need to read access to information in different packages and not one, uh, one kind uh, alone. Uh, the third bit, which was also a bit of a surprise given uh, who he was, um, I spoke about him loving to learn and loving to do new things, is he is really um, drive towards the use of technology and making sure um, reaching as many people as much as possible. And for him, and I think as uh, Professor Njuguna touched on, um, um, issues around financial inclusion, those are very important to him and were very dear and you would hear him um, in a lot of platforms talking about how he believes we need to reach to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, the people who are really uh, far away and how they can have access and then able to produce productively. And he would move very quickly from a very macro discussion and take you very quickly to a meso and suddenly you're in a micro discussion just to uh, make you understand what he is really referring to. And for him, technology was the way and was the, um, uh, was the way not only to reach more, but he believes the disruption that the technology would bring will actually help uh, to enhance uh, lives of so many people. And the last, and I think all the other speakers touched on, is um, his belief in capacity building. And when he speaks of capacity building, he means everything from like um, the methodological uh, kind of like trainings to like high level kind of like discussions but then importantly, even having people um, uh, set aside for several days just to make sure they understand an issue better, he was really good at that. And I, I found that was very interesting. As I said, at the given his name and what he has accomplished, you always see, you would always think it would be very difficult uh, for him to give you your time. But if you would bring something that is really dear to him, he will be ready and he will be available to speak to all different kind of the audiences, not just economists. Um, and I heard a lot about economists here, but for instance, um, uh, while I was at Repoa, we had this course where we, when we were uh, talking about harnessing natural resources for development, he came in and he was willing uh, to talk to the group of young people who were really interested to understand how actually are natural resources important in creating development um, um, in the in the country. And he again opened up himself so much in such a way we were like, okay. Yes, Professor Ben Ondulo, we knew about this, but then it was important to, to, to hear him really encourage other people from other fields to understand better economics. And the last bit, as I said, um, with him, uh, we were together as he was the president of the Economic Society of Tanzania. The last time, um, and it's sad that this was the last time that we were with him, um, it was during uh, something we call sneakers and heels, and this was uh, um, uh, uh, um, a mentoring program for mid-career women, and it was around looking at women who are in the transport sector. And he was like, Blandina, you're bringing me full circle, and I think I will come and speak to the women and tell them some of the opportunities that are, are there. And he was fantastic. And he was saying, just because the sector is male-dominated, Technology is really disrupting all this, and there are lots of opportunities that we can actually um, undertake um, and get more women uh, involved, more diversified groups uh, involved more productively. Um, of course, uh, you can't speak about Finn in 10 minutes, but I thought I would share um, those few. Finn, thank you so much, and all the others, thanks. Andina, <clears throat> thanks so much for they interpret to Benus many qualities when it comes to mentoring, and you were spot on. May, may, on, may I, on behalf of both myself, as well as everybody who have been uh, listening uh, to Steve and Yuguna, Ernest and Blandina, express sincere gratitude for capturing so aptly Benus' many contributions and his enduring professional and personal importance to all of us. With your permission, uh, we will share your contributions with Benner's family as a statement of how much we appreciate their sharing 
his valuable time and profound inspiration with us. I'm sure you will understand that it was with both commitment and gratitude to Benny's memory that this session was put together. To be sure, Benno will continue to live with us in our minds and hearts as a great inspiration he always was and is. May Benno's soul rest in eternal peace. And may I invite you all to observe a minute of silence in honor of Professor Benno Ndulu, leading colleague, chair of the UNU wider board, and dear, dear friend. Thank you very, very much. And may I now invite you to join us in the thematic coffee room continuation of the Benuanduru special session. I look forward to seeing you there where we can share memories of Benuanduru.